my talk. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Drombos, of course, and man, uh, I, I thought I had something cool that I was going to go with uh, there, but but I don't. I don't. I'm going to give you a quick uh, life update because I think that's what happens in these first couple minutes of the podcast. Amazing guest on today's show, though, by the way. If you were a listener, I think it was last season, I was reading an article from WeAreMeToo.com talking about Latinos and therapy and mental health in general and i know for some of you like man you talk about this all the time you might be, you might be thinking that or maybe that's my imposter syndrome sneaking in i'm not sure but i think it is a conversation that continues to need to be had especially in our community and i also love the idea of speaking to somebody who's from our community who is a therapist does this for a living and really discussing sort of the nuances of, of having somebody who kind of comes from your background being the person sort of guiding you or helping you through particular situations. There's a lot of power in in that. So I, I wanted to have her on the show to kind of talk about that in general. And I had mentioned when we did the episode where I referenced an article from WeAreMeToo.com, I was like, oh, I should get this person on the show. And boom, here we are. Your boy did it. He followed through on one of his promises from the podcast. So that's where we are today. Uh, Dr. Lizette Sanchez uh, is going to be on the show. She's a therapist, speaker, writer, incredible human being. Uh, again, I referenced her on an episode, I think it was last season, just discussing different things when it comes specifically to Latinos and mental health. So we'll talk about all that with her, with me. What's going on with me? Thank you for asking. Um, man, I feel like I, I've i come to a realization. I'm going to say that I'm going to get into this quickly so we can get to the interview with, with Dr. Lizette Sanchez. But I was talking to my therapist and I was basically in complete denial of the fact that your boy is burnt out. And I know what I'm thinking, what you might be thinking is, well, you had a nice break, like a month and a half off before you started season three of the podcast. And that's true. I did. But logically, realistically, I was still kind of in like a work mentality. Yeah, I took some more time off. Yeah, I vacationed a bit. I traveled a little bit. I, you know, um, part partook is that partook in some you know nightlife uh, activities with friends but I still was kind of running around I still was filling the time with projects that I didn't have time for when the whole podcast season was happening so I really did it sort of shut down the engines if you will and I think I also came in incredibly hot off of vacation really trying to be incredibly disciplined and almost like machine like and i haven't made much time for a real personal life in a long time even prior to this and i think it's all sort of caught up with me a little bit so yeah i, I kind of came to the conclusion with my therapist like shocker you're burnt out man that's why you're not feeling incredibly motivated to do a lot right now so um i've kind of been in and out of these funks i think you've heard me kind of reference it or or talk about it a bit on the show so uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to just get back into a bit of a more creative mode, and not be so productivity driven in the current moment. And and now it's like a big year for me for a number of different reasons. But I also I think have to recognize that I'm not going to be at my best or doing my best work if I'm burnt out. Right? I'm not highly motivated. I'm just sort of getting by on fumes right now. And for me, diving into some of my creative passions, I think is a way to sort of get out of the productivity loop and just create for the sake of creating like you know music and djing has sort of energized me again recently and i think i'm going to kind of lean into it a bit and and not have expectations but just from the the point of view of it's something i love doing something i enjoy doing and it fills my cup a bit you know so i want to lean back into that just for the sake of having fun and, and and building kind of a a dj brand again if you will I, that's always fun to me and I'm also just really excited about what we have going on with Just Be as well, which is obviously still work, but I think it allows me to flex my creative muscles in so many different ways, um, which I'm I'm grateful for. So um, I'm kind of just leaning into that stuff and really just like being hyper creative or, or trying to be um, and scratch all the different itches that I have, um, you know, without trying to put too many expectations on them for being anything like 
monetarily that that are going to be successful to so to speak i hope that makes sense but i'm, I'm yeah I, like today i just was like I had a creative itch to like work on a video idea and that's what i did for like the first half of the day i just kind of like was it was digging up old footage which was really like nostalgic uh and i felt really grateful i was pulling up footage from like when i was 18 19 20 21 years old and and then even uh, I got reminded on um, on Facebook because I logged onto Facebook randomly, and you know you get those old pictures from like ten years ago, and it was a picture of me ten years ago in Miami at Miami Music Week, like a big DJ conference that happens there. And I'm just thinking about I put myself in the place of that kid ten years ago who was trying to make him a name for himself in DJing, and and it wasn't even on the radio at that point. It wasn't you know it just really was a local New Jersey DJ. And just trying to hustle and make something happen, you know, still living at home with his parents and, and all of the above. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I was, like, looking at that kid and and just thinking about how blown away he would be if he saw how far we got to, you know, like where we are today. And it just made me incredibly grateful and, and sort of, like, brought me back down to reality a little bit to just all that I'm doing, all that I've done, and, and how much there is to be grateful for, so. Yeah, that's my little share for for today's show. With that said, I want to get into mental health. I want to talk about mental health specifically from the lens of our community and and the challenges that face our community and the sort of the sort of it's I don't know if you would say like stereotypes or the the sort of notions that many people in our community have about uh, therapy and mental health and the stigmas, if you will, that's the word I was looking for, the stigmas around mental health that exist in our community. So I'm really excited to to bring on today's guest. As always, um, if you hear any ruffling in the background, it's my eighty something pound dog being completely restless and deciding that as soon as I hit record is the time that he's going to toss and turn all over the rug and carpet and just knock everything over in the studio. So yeah, if you hear those noises, that's what it is. <laughs> Without further ado, let's bring on today's guest as a part of our Mi Gente segment. Mi Gente! My guest today is a therapist, writer, and speaker known as the first-gen psychologist, Dr. Lizette Sanchez. How you feeling? Hey, I'm so excited to be here and so happy to just be in community and have a very important conversation. Yes, absolutely. And I'm I'm really grateful to, to have you on the show because I, I think I told you this when we were kind of emailing back and forth, but I kind of seen some of your work uh, via We Are Me Too. They had done an article on, on Latin mental health that we actually uh, shared here on the show. And I remember as I was kind of reading this stuff, I was like, I, I want to get her on, on the show because she's bringing up a lot of really amazing points. And as normal as mental health has become for myself personally and those around me, I'm always shocked at how much of, of the stigma still exists throughout our community. How many you know people within our community still are are sort of anti mental health or live in fear of it or whatever it might be. So I'm really excited to kind of bring you on. And any chance that I get to bring on somebody who uh, is from our community and advocates for for mental health, I always love to have a, this conversation because I think it's your work is just so incredibly important. I really appreciate you saying that. I think that. Like, I feel that my work is very important, but that's why I'm showing up everywhere, right? Because sure. I'm so passionate about this knowledge. I'm so passionate around, you know, like you mentioned, oh, therapy is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like a broken shirt oftentimes when I'm yeah. trying to share the message around what what is therapy? What is mental health? And how do yeah. we destigmatize from messages that maybe we heard when we were younger of, la terapia es solo para locos. Mm -hmm. Like, if you go to therapy, that means person yeah. if therapy is only for white people like yeah. all of the different barriers that we place to something that is just life-changing right because yeah. therapy and to challenge everything is that therapy is for everyone at any stage of their life mm -hmm. because therapy the whole purpose of it is to help improve the quality of your life yes. right so maybe you're not in a crisis so you think I don't need therapy, but that's actually the best time. The best time to get that support is when you're not in a crisis, because that's when you can really do deeper work into learning more about yourself, how you exist in the world, mm -hmm. why maybe you react to situations a certain way um, and learn learn more about that. Oftentimes we we blame ourselves for so mm -hmm. much. And when we talk to someone else, we learn it's not really all about that. 
right? So like, that's a big message. Um, so again, not for crazy people, it's mm -hmm. for everyone. And, and the representation in, I, I, when I think of mental health professionals sure. is, be, is more diverse, I think every day. Mm. Uh, and so in the past, you know, I think when people think of therapy, you probably think of that image of Freud, someone yeah. on the couch, like, an, like older white man taking notes right. and right. that it, 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 that, <laughs> that seems so vulnerable, mm -hmm. but, um, but what I love about social media is I think that we can sh give examples of like, you know, sometimes therapy is, you know, like what's the cheese met today, you know, right. like, go down, you know, like what's and like what's the tea what are we talking about um mm -hmm. because how we communicate in generations also changes right so yeah um it's not that sterile is i guess what i'm trying to say it's not that sterile yeah that's very well said i i would i would definitely agree and i think i, I will we'll start there where you know i think i'm quoting you from that same article where you said there's often a belief that one must have a severe problem to seek therapy or assistance right and I think that is the giant misconception that I even I had when I first started going to therapy in my my twenties, and I was fearful of even telling anybody that I was going to therapy, was because when you use words like depression or anxiety or you know needing help, uh, using that phrase, everybody immediately jumps to the worst case scenario: you're losing your mind, you need to be placed on a suicide watch, we can't leave you alone, there's something extremely wrong, you can't function. When there are obviously varying levels of, of mental health, you know, crises or, or just needing somebody to talk to that is, isn't in your life that can give you a, a real, you know, um, guided sort of way of, of looking at things that doesn't have the preconceived notions of the people around you. Right. So let's kind of, you know, start there. I know we touched on it, but you know, let's talk a bit about that, that belief that therapy has to be when you're in crisis and, and also even just the idea of, of continuing therapy when you are in a good place, you know, the, the benefits of sort of that maintenance mode that exists, I feel like as well. Yes, I love that you're calling it maintenance mode because that's really is what we talk about with my clients when we get to that point. I'm like, yeah. you're you're ready, you're ready to graduate therapy, you know, like AKA right. you've met the goals set for therapy um, and we can continue working together or you can, you know, as needed. And most of them, most people I work with just normalize this choose to stay on to have at least monthly what we call maintenance sessions monthly mm -hmm. sessions where we're checking in to make sure they're still managing um you know whatever the stressors were going on with their life they're still keeping up with the coping skills that maybe we learned they're still holding the boundaries that maybe mm -hmm. we talked about and so that's to speak to that but then to come back to your other question is you know i think we i think people often view therapy as a last resort you think mm. of therapy as the emergency room right yeah. like and and let's talk about what that's like in our like Latina community. So, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes there's a, depending on whatever country people are coming from. And I would say, you know, my parents are from Mexico and El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a distrust of medical systems. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that I can trust you. And then you come here and we don't know what your documentation status might be. Sure. That also then impacts the distrust of the system. So when we don't trust the system, that means that we'll only use it if we have we feel that we have no other options, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. And so you hear this a lot with people who don't go to the doctor. They don't go to their annual checkups. They don't go to, so I wanna say like all of the things that we think of as maybe normal, that mm -hmm. also comes with a lot of privilege, like get, having your annual exam, all of that. Sure. Um, but everyone at some point has a crisis or emergency unfortunately I, I i don't mean to say this in a, in a positive way but um that leads you to a point where you can no longer cope with this on your own mm -hmm. and so then you emergency room and so when you go to therapy just for crisis you're treating it like the emergency room mm -hmm. and what does the emergency room do it's like they just maybe give you a script they patch you up and you're like you're on your way but they don't they don't really fix anything for you they kind of mm -hmm. just give you like a temporary band-aid and mm -hmm. till next time maybe mm -hmm. right and it's, it kind of feels like it's just holding it together right so if you seek out therapy when you're in that full crisis and and that goes to that image that people imagine oh i'm going to be hospitalized i'm going to be held against my will mm -hmm. that's not necessarily always the case sure. hospitalization and i want to say this to normalize it is an it's a last resort it's a lot definitely a last resort for me Mm -hmm. I do not take hospitalizations lightly. This is not right. something that anyone who comes in the crisis, I'm like, oh, time to go to hospital. Right. The only time that someone is hospitalized is if they 
are going to be an imminent danger to themselves or others. Sure. That's if you tell me the moment I leave this room, I'm going to end my life or someone else's life. Mm -hmm. um, that's when the hospitalization is necessary. That is not what most crises look like or feel like for people. Mm -hmm. We might have moments where we feel like desperate yeah. and out of sorts, um, like that burnout, the, maybe I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to do any of these things. Mm -hmm. And that's an emotional crisis, but that's not a hospitalization needed crisis. That's not right. ER. Um, but anyway, but when we wait to that point, right now, we now the work, definitely we can really do a lot of good work, but the work is then first starts on that emergency room intervention, which is like, we're going to do a band aid. How do we kind of help you hold it together? Right. Um, and how do we help you establish that strong foundation, and then we build from there together, right? So, um, with and if when you're not, I'm trying to think of like how to simplify this. And when you come to therapy, when you're not in a crisis, when mm -hmm. it's when you're maybe in a good place, yeah. you already have a strong foundation. So mm -hmm. that part, that foundation, is so important because that's the, and I, I'm calling it foundation, but essentially your baseline for sure. how much how, how much stress you can handle at one time. Mm -hmm. We all have a different baseline, what that is. Um, and let's say like our baseline is here, you know, our emotions can sometimes go, you know, up and down, but we mostly stay around the baseline and that's sure. good. That's what we want. We don't want too high highs or too low lows, mm -hmm. but when we have no baseline, cause we don't have that foundation, we're just doing this the whole yeah. time. Right. And so when we have the we're in a good place, we have that foundation. So our moods feel are feeling like they're in a good place. So then when we're learning skills for how to manage them, it helps us keep it level, helps us sure. stay in a good place. Right. And again, when we're in the crisis, we're gonna be going, we're trying to go from down here just up to the baseline, right? Right. Um, right. just to help balance. Yeah. Yeah, it's I'll and, and there, I, I feel like No, no, I, I I love that you're kind of explaining the different levels to all this and i think the uh, the general idea of it is it wherever you are therapy is always a good answer for you right it's, it's always a a sort of good place to to reach out to and it's interesting kind of speaking about parents and you know the sort of stigmas that that exist within our community um because even within you know my own with with my own you know mother we, we had a conversation recently talking about because I've, I've struggled with depression you know for um, you know, I mean, as, I guess as long as I can remember, and the, the, she kind of had a a you know moment where she was saying to me like, I can't believe I didn't recognize it or see it, you know, um, see that that was what was going on with you like during your teenage years or whatever, you know, and she was kind of I guess beating herself up a little bit because she was an educator, so she's you know to her it's like I should be able to sort of as an educator and and you know sort of being somebody trained in in a bit of of the behavior of, of kids, I should be able to recognize it in my own son, but I didn't, I failed to, you know, and, you know, she sort of didn't know if that was sort of her own um, kind of maybe the stigma she had a around mental health and didn't want to believe that about her own son, right. But it's it is interesting, I think, you know, how our our parents be their own because of their own sort of um belief systems and and sort of fear of of the idea of mental health or just not knowing what to look for you know sort of how unequipped unfortunately so many people in our lives are to actually give us assistance when we are going through some of these sort of darker periods throughout the course of our lives you know when you were sharing that about your mom there was i was waiting for you to share something else i was waiting because it's another common narrative that i heard where the parent mm. is uh, have, have a has a hard time accepting that something's happening with their child because mm -hmm. they feel that they are to blame for mm. what's happening with them, right? Mm. Just waiting for you to say something, right? And so, and, yeah. and you said it. How did I not see it? Right. How did I not see it? Like I, I work with, you know, I'm in education. I should have seen it, right? And, yeah. and it becomes this other self cycle, right? Um, but the the reality is is that she was doing her best with everything she had and all the mm. knowledge she had at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, you know, part of my work is also educating people on their on having more self compassion, right? Right? Like, this is hard. This is hard to come back and reflect and have to deal with the, those emotions. And I think that's why many people will shy away from them, because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you know, you said you've been in therapy, you said that this thing you've been working through for a very long time, mm -hmm. you know how much work it is. Yeah. Not, um, and 
I'm not saying that life is easy, but that familiarity to those challenges we experience in day-to-day -day life sometimes feels easier to manage than the newness of, of endless possibilities. Right. 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 Yeah. That's actually a great way to, to put it. Yeah. I think the, the sort of the devil, you know, almost right. Um, is, is a mm -hmm. bit more comfortable in, in some sort of weird way than like having to go down the rabbit hole of like, figuring out what's going on and, and figuring out how to treat it and, and, and be more aware of it and, and what, you know, practices, I guess we could adapt. And I think, I think that's where a lot of people probably get stuck as well, right, is, is within the comfort, even in your own misery, there's still comfort there, right? It, and that's sort of the um, hard part, I think, of, about life and as a human being in general is that we have the capability of normalizing so much that we sort of hold ourselves back from from actually correcting things when we should or when we can, you know, um, because we, we, you know, really are always programmed to just seek comfort, seek comfort, even if it is the very thing that is causing us our unhappiness and our dissatisfaction with life. Exactly. Seek comfort. And, you know, also, I don't know about you, but I grew up with it's like, this is just how things are with the message, right? right? This is just how things are. And yeah. you can do to change it. Um, which is a very disempowering message to receive when you're younger. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a message that comes from the lived realities of the, of the people who are telling us that, right? Yes. Like, or I think of, you know, again, my parents coming from their like respective countries and the experiences that they had, you know, they didn't have access to education really where they were living. Mm -hmm. um, mom would learn through a traveling school teacher is how she learned to read and write. Right. Um, my dad was part of a big family there were 11 children so wow. and he's one of the older ones so yeah. at some point he needed to work to provide yeah. for the family to help to help you know make sure everyone was eating and so so their internalized messages like this is just how things are and we have to accept that uh and but when mm -hmm. but the whole point of their creation story and the narrative is because they were in search for another life right, right. and so sometimes having to remind them of well, we are, we're also now here because we don't want to accept that reality anymore mm -hmm. because we want to consider that there's life that I can live where I can be at peace. I can have my joy. Mm -hmm. I can feel, you know, unconditional love. Um, and I think that, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think these are three things that I really want in my life. Sure, <laughs> like my sure. love, my joy, and my peace. Yeah, yeah, well, 100%. Um, hey, wait, you know, something that's come to my mind as as we're just like talking is because we've normalized the struggle so much within our community, right? Like in, in Puerto Rico, they call it like, like living in La Brega, right? You're like constantly in the struggle. We've normalized it. And, you know, even like like post hurricane, you had a lot of people talking about like, we're tired of of ha of being resourceful, of being resilient. Like we we're tired, right? That's not a badge of honor anymore. And, and I yeah. think you know, what's coming to my mind that I would love to kind of pick your brain on a bit is, especially in kind of this mm -hmm. hustle culture that we exist in today, grind, 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 right? And like the biggest complaint about the new generation is nobody works hard anymore. Nobody wants to put in the work, blah, 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 right? And it's this very sort of toxic idea around hustling and what it means to be productive and, and all of these different things, right? And I think what I struggle with is if I'm not in the grinding mode, if I'm not burning the candle at both ends, how do I stay motivated, right? Because that's like the easiest sort of fuel to find is when you are living with resentment that you're trying to prove somebody wrong, when you are seeking validation, those are the easy ones to find to give you the motivation to to push past the exhaustion, right? And to, you know, whatever, uh, pull an all nighter to get a, a project done. But what I struggle with is how do I, I know that, that that's toxic. I know that that's unhealthy for me to live with those sort of negative emotions and, and sort of coexist with them in that way and embrace them and celebrate them. How can I still find, you know, sort of the motivation from the happier stuff? I think that's the, the balance I think is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, when you aren't with your back against the wall, how do you still keep that same level of energy, you know, in a more positive manner, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think this goes back also to what we were talking about earlier is the whole the devil, you know, right? Yeah, like when all you know, to like, yeah. overwork yourself and mm -hmm. be burned out and be exhausted all the time. What happens when we don't feel exhausted? And when we're not busy, you start mm -hmm. to feel like, oh, I'm lazy. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm not doing enough. I could be doing more like, 
I am not making the sacrifices of my ancestors worth it. Right, like, right. And, and who, <laughs> right? It's like it's uh, the amount of guilt. The getting guilt drives a lot of progress for people. Yeah. It's like I feel guilty because you know X Y Z. You know, Fulano sure. did this for me. Um, but we don't. We should, we don't need to always be driven by guilt, right? We don't mm. always have to be. It doesn't always have to be the devil you know. As long as you're right. willing to take a risk to try it a different way. Sure. Now, maybe that shifts the timeline of your project. Mm. Maybe you were like set on wanting to get something done by the end of this month, but you, that's only possible if you're working around the clock. Right. Um, and so now there has to be a shift in the timeline if you're slowing it down. But what we don't focus on, we focus on, oh, my deadline's going to have to get shifted. I'm not going to be able to get it done by when I wanted to. That makes me a failure. Right. But instead, the focus should be on, well, but what I will have is sleep every night. I will sleep. I will have mm. good rest. Mm. I will have time to exercise and take care of my body so that long term, long term, I can mm. actually maintain this business or this dream or whatever I have built. Because when we're thinking hustle, culture, hustle, mindset, like work mm -hmm. nonstop, anyone can do that. But for a short period of time, mm. at some point, it catches up to you. It catches up to you physically, emotionally, spiritually. I think in every single level of your being, it catches up to you. Mm. And then what happens? Then you have to completely stop. Mm. You come to a full halt. Yeah. And so all of this sprinting that you were doing, no more progress. Because mm. now, like now it feels like you can't function. And I don't know if you have ever experienced that level of burnout drama. Oh, for but sure. I know that I have. Yeah. <laughs> I know that I have. Um and that's my normal state of that i've normalized that as my baseline which is the like if i'm not mm -hmm. you know and i and i i've you know i've gotten a lot better at it but for a while if i wasn't completely exhausted to the point that like you know you sit me down for 10 seconds i'm falling asleep somewhere like then i wasn't working hard enough that's what i normalized was burnout basically that was my baseline yeah it was your baseline right yeah. was, we can't have that always be the baseline and you know what earlier before we went on this i was saying you know I love some, there's something about the East Coast that I just love. And I love the sure. energy and I love, I yeah. love that from being in the cities. Um, but what I don't miss was that constant pressure to be on all, all the time. I don't miss mm. leaving my, you know, like leaving my apartment at, you know, six, seven in the morning and getting back at eight, 9 PM at night to still do more work and right. romanticizing and thinking, oh, that was so amazing. I got, I'm living the dream. I get to do all these, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I don't miss that. But when I say I miss New York or I miss the East Coast, I, I do just miss the like energy of sure. when I was out at Central, like my favorite memories are it's like when I'm out at Central Park because right. I got to go see a concert to have joy, yeah. you know, like I got to go, you know, ice skating at Bryant Park or whatever, mm -hmm. all, like all the, I got to go be a tourist in this right. amazing city like world known like that's really what i miss the most right but i definitely don't miss 16 hour days but mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes i do actually sometimes i do right sometimes <laughs> I'm like, oh, version of me that did all of that sure but that version of me and i'm sure that version of you mm -hmm. which is they were the current version of you which is mm -hmm. a version and i'm assuming i'm assuming that now there's a more balance in your life slightly <laughs> so, yeah yeah we're, it's still a work in progress but definitely like we're prioritizing sleep which is a gigantic you know step forward you know what i mean i don't sacrifice my sleep for anything so that's a a huge but, milestone forward but I, I think to your point when thinking about like you know geographically where people live and kind of the normalization of culture it, I, I do go to like when I go to Puerto Rico, I feel a different energy from people. It, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, a lot of people aren't living with an abundance of wealth, but they seem incredibly happy or they're living longer lives. You go and like I might complain at how long it takes to get food or something like that, but like they're in no rush. I'm actually the weird one who's rushing to get through ordering food and get, you know what I mean? Like, where do I have to go? I'm on vacation, right? But I'm, I've been conditioned to be go, go, go all the time. And that's why, you know, I sort of have this roller coaster ride and they seem to be living a far more peaceful existence, sort of kind of going with the flow. And I think it, it speaks to to that, you know, that to, to that point that you're you're sort of making is, is you know, um, a lot of times it depends culturally what's been sort of normalized. And I think probably many of our parents who came over here adapted that go 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 mindset because that's what they had to do to survive over here and sort of forgot about 
you know, the peaceful life that they left behind and the the mindset that was there that has like, you know, my grandfather's almost 100 years old, you know what I mean? It's still like functioning, you know what I mean? So like, it's obvious that there's a difference, you know, between the lifestyle that he has over there in Puerto Rico and my dad who's mm-hmm. here, you know, in the States, uh, you know, and, and battling his own health issues, you know, at a way younger age. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, hey, I I, I like the amount of snaps somebody with your grandfather, 100 years old. Like, <laughs> yeah. Them. Yeah, I like hope that he's like chilling out, like I don't know, enjoying the beach somewhere right now. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> like they're looking out at least. Yeah. I um, yeah, but no, absolutely. I think that being, a, I, I think what you were sharing that I thought about right. The other messages that I would hear often from my parents and that the clients I work with here often is, you mm-hmm. know, like I want, I don't want you like from their parents. It's like I don't want you to have to work as hard as I did. Right. I don't want you to break your back and do like these very le- physically demanding jobs. Mm-hmm. And that's that was a message I hear. And, you know, again, people are with here when the priority was, I want you to focus on your education. I want you mm-hmm. to focus on um, how do we increase your access? However, the hard part about this is that that was their, their value and their hope, but they didn't really fully understand what they were encouraging you to do and what they mm-hmm. wanted you to do because it's so different than what they knew. So then when it starts to happen, it's jarring for them too, right? Mm. So um, when I I moved away for college for my undergrad, I moved away, it was a two hour drive. So I went Mm. from LA to San Diego Mm. and I was strategic about this because I knew my parents, I'm the oldest, I'm the firstborn, they they don't want me to leave. But I did not apply anywhere that was driving distance from LA. I was like, (laughs) I would have to move. And then I chose San Diego because my father's side of the family is in Tecate, which is a border town. Mm. And so my mind, I'm like, Dad, I'm literally a sandwich between L.A. and Tecate. Yeah. And so if I need any family, like they could, like I was prepared to like make this argument yeah. <laughs> for them. But <laughs> but I share this because but we, because when the time came to move out, mm-hmm. even though the messaging was, please go to college, please go get an education, do all of these things. My parents were not happy with me. Mm. My mom, my mom's narrative at that time was, you have been brainwashed. You are mm. abandoning your family. Mm. How could you do this? You just want to get away from us. Mm-hmm. And in truth, I mean, I did. I'm not going to, I go get her that. She wasn't wrong. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I, I need yeah. to get, I, was like, I need some space. I need some space. Like, sure. I want to, <laughs> uh, small apartment. So like, yeah. I'll give her that. But, but I was, but I, but I understood, I can understand more now where she was coming from. Now we've been able to work through that and talk through that. And yeah. she thinks back, she's like, you know, I just didn't understand. I understand right. now that you really were trying to go to school, um, but I didn't get it fully. Mm-hmm. Right. Even though the message that we told you all the time, it wasn't, it was, right. I didn't expect, it to, you know, in her mind, I would live at home, go to community college, and at 25 years old, get married, meet, meet you know, and, yeah. and someone else take care of me, right? Right. Um, but just to say just how much, like, our families, uh, pers- pers- I guess, like, sorry, our family's expectations of us mm-hmm. um, impact just the choices that we make. Yes. However, their expectations are, are grounded in the limited knowledge that they have. And yes. so they don't see the full picture. Um, and so that's when some of the conflict arises between the children and the parents, right? Mm-hmm. Within that journey. Yeah, that's actually a fascinating kind of uh, path I wanna go down a little bit because, you know, and, and we can kind of pull it full circle. We talked about like the traditional sense of psychology, you mentioned Freud, but like Carl Jung talks about the idea of like the shadow self, right? And and um the part of ourselves we're almost like ashamed to let the world see we wear a mask you know and i think a lot of of what we struggle with in our own happiness and fulfillment is the fear of judgment by the outside world and specifically in our community where your family is in your business you know and is sort of has zero boundaries for the most part right there's no boundaries in, in our community uh for the most part it's like you know a lot of people hold back their own happiness for the sake of of what their parents may think of them or what their family may think of them and i think a lot of people are are really living 
as shells of themselves because of this of this fear, right? You know, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people in your position who would have allowed their parents' guilt to make them go to that community college, to not go away, to have that experience of, of independence. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, sort of um, never leave the the house, right, until they're they're married because it's like this guilt trip that happens. Why would you want to move out somewhere? Our house isn't good enough for you, right? When these are all sorts of rites of passage to become an adult, to find yourself, to really find what makes you happy. And without them, it's hard to know where your parents' opinion of who you should be um, ends and where your true authentic self actually begins, right? So I, I'd, I'd love to kind of talk a bit about that. I know boundaries is a big thing for you that you talk about on, on social media a lot, but you know, kind of what would happens that you've seen for a lot of people where they're really living in fear of, of being able to fully express themselves because of the sort of tight knit community family existence that we all grew up uh, on for the most part. It's so real. It's so, so real. Like, mm -hmm. and um, I think guilt mm -hmm. is a huge contributor to mm -hmm. the like feeling, feeling stuck for an individual in terms sure. of, I, think how, I loved how you said that, like, where do your expectations of who you are supposed to be from your parents end and where do you and your authentic self begin? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's when we release the guilt that we feel about needing to adhere to these expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually just had a wonderful conversation with someone about guilt. And so like, this is very fresh in my mind. Yeah. And, you know, with it, it's breaking down, well, what does, what is guilt? Right. We always talk about, I feel guilty, you know, I think, I think naturally in a lot of like the Latina communication styles, it's a lot of guilt, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't come see me today. Right. Like, why right. don't you like ever like call me anymore? Like, and, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you could just say you miss me. You could right. just say that. <laughs> why yeah. we got to make it so clear? So I've yeah. learned to kind of joke about it with people when they try to make me feel guilty about something i'm mm -hmm. like let's talk about what you're really saying right just tell me that right? yeah but guilt what it is it's like a misalignment of a value that you have and maybe the the action that you're engaging in right mm -hmm. and so um when i in my story of you know wanting to move away to college there was a guilt associated there because the value was be with family mm -hmm. and be like collectivistic but i also valued higher education and becoming mm -hmm. successful and being independent. So I'm holding these two values, but one of them is in misalignment, which is mm -hmm. uh, you want to be successful. You should, sorry, the, do you want to, you never want to leave your family right. right? with my actions that I'm feel guilty about that. Right. But if we, if you, so, so it's a normal reaction to have. So it's a normal feeling to have, Oh, I feel guilty because this is something that's new and that's different that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. However, there's a difference between guilty for doing something, feeling guilty for doing something wrong and feeling guilty because we're in misalignment, mm. right? So this misalignment in the values is something that I, like that example that I just shared. Guilty because you did something wrong, um, you know, like I have a younger brother, he's six years older than me, right? Like if I play a prank on him and he actually gets hurt, I'm going to feel guilty because I actually, I did something wrong, you know, right. like... What is it? I can't. I wish I could think of an example of saying that, but so, you know, like it's sibling sibling rivalry. Sure, um, sure. My cousin ripped the heads off my Barbies. I hope he feels guilty for that because that <laughs> made me sad. But right. but like that's that's just that's that's a different kind of guilt that we're talking about, right? Yeah. So this other guilt, this emotional guilt, that's because of the values being in conflict, feels so much, so much bigger, so insurmountable. But that's not the case because. Mm -hmm. All it is is signifying that there is a change that is happening and you have now a choice to make around which direction you're going to lean into with this mm -hmm. change. Are you going to let the guilt guide it or are you going to lean into the the larger value that was the calling that you had, right? Mm -hmm. So for like, again, back to example, the guilt, if I felt, if I lean into the guilt, I would have stayed home. Mm -hmm. I would have gone to community college, would have followed the journey, probably, maybe would have still been a psychologist. I don't know. Sure. Um, but I'm not saying that that path doesn't lead to success, but that's not the path I chose. In my mind, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go to college and I was so afraid that if I started at community college, I'd get stuck somehow. Mm -hmm. My parents, you know, like, there was a lot of other narratives I had in my mind. Mm -hmm. So pushing through that guilt and taking a chance, taking that leap of faith, mm -hmm. um, 
was was what ultimately helped me get to the other side of that guilt, which was the the peace that I felt with the decision, and then a place where I could have a more rational conversation with my family about this. Mm. Right. So we all came back together. Like this didn't break us apart. Right. And I think sometimes that's what we fear will happen when we set a boundary, mm. but. Um, the guilt and boundaries are so closely related, right? We set sure. a boundary, we feel guilty for doing it. Um, and so being able to navigate that guilt empowers us to be able to set better boundaries. And as a reminder, boundaries are there so that you can tell people how you want to be treated, how you want mm -hmm. to know, like, what is the best way for you to exist in this world with them? Right. And and that's all you're trying to say is I want to spend time with you. And the best way for me to feel loved or to love you is for me to get some time to recharge on my own before mm -hmm. I do this. Right. Or mm -hmm. I can only offer you an hour of my time because after that, I get so drained because yeah. I'm an introvert for, for my introverts out there. So um it always it always comes from love, but that's not what it feels like always. Yeah. Yeah, those are the the sort of like the difficult conversations that we often avoid, but we have to have them, you know, we, we have to be able to, to face it head on. And, and, um, and I think, I, I think again, to, to many of the points that you're bringing up, it's important to recognize where these things are coming from, you know, and, and saying like, you know, my mom is not um, guilting me about going away because, you know, she hates me. It's because she loves me so much that she's in fear of me not being there every day with her, right? She loves having me around so much, you know? And I think it's easy to like, uh, you know, build up this resentment or or take it a different type of way. But I think um, that's why those conversations are so necessary because it kind of opens your eyes to where this other person is coming from and and allows you to to then process it maybe in a more healthy manner right and not be sort of holding on to um unnecessary negative emotions that might not actually even have any real merit you know um when, once you get to know where the other person was was coming from yeah and we don't always have the capacity to offer that when mm -hmm. we're being when we're doing everything out of guilt because when we're doing sure. everything out of guilt that means we're not pouring into ourselves which mm -hmm. means that we don't have like the energy to give away for that right so then when you yeah. get the guilted like you never come see me anymore mm -hmm. then then the reaction instead of being oh you're missing me let's have a conversation about this then i'm depleted so i'm defensive what right. are you talking about we, we talk every day i saw you last weekend what do you right. you know what else more do you want from me i give you all of myself i give me nothing right, right? so that's i think a, a really important um i guess a uh, like area to focus on and that's something that a lot of people do the work in in therapy right? mm -hmm. like and that's and just to bring it back it's yeah. okay, what can therapy help with therapy can help you maybe release some of the guilt so that you can arrive at the point where you can engage in like a productive conversation as opposed to just clashing all the time right mm -hmm. and so that's that's a, and, and a therapist can help guide you and provide you with resources for how you frame things with your family because we know family dynamics are very mm -hmm. unique. And especially when you're in a collectivistic culture and background, mm -hmm. um, it's very different than the stereotypical boundaries that you see people set. Sure. Um, and if you have a culturally informed therapist who can help and recognize like, okay, we want to, you, you really, you respect this person and you want to make sure right. you set a boundary that doesn't make them feel disrespected. Let's talk about how we do that. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's ease into it. Right. Yeah, and I, I love that angle that you kind of took even from saying, you know, that if you are yourself burnt out or depleted, you're not going to react in a good way to whatever's being brought to you, right? And then I think that's sort of what you have to realize, you know, I, like for me, the boundary I've set is like, I'm not answering my dad's calls before 11 a.m. because that's like my time where I'm getting up, I'm doing my, my morning routine, my meditation, I'm getting like my own sort of things that are my priority done that early. And because I don't, I can't get on the phone with him, then have an argument about something that's on his mind, that's his priority, that then puts me in a bad mood, that messes up the rest of my day. You know, I have to have that that boundary because I, I, my dad is like a Type A personality, so for him, it's like he sets his mind on something, boom, 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 it has to get done. And if you don't drop everything you're doing, he gets defensive about it, and I know that, right? So I have to set that boundary where I say. I'm not going to be in a good place. I'm going to end up just getting into a fight, getting provoked because I'm going to get annoyed with him that he's sort of uh, overstepping into my precious time. Right. 
And it's up to me to set that boundary to then know later on in the day, once I've, I've felt like, you know, I've gotten my stuff done for me, I'll be in a far better place to just sort of yes him and listen to what he has to say and not have it turned into a an argument or a fight, right? But I, I, I sort of, I love that that perspective that you you sort of brought up and, and co-signed in that. And I do also want to want to talk a bit about the world that we exist in today. I mean, even just outside of our community, I, I feel like I haven't talked to anybody in the world of mental health and, and therapy and things like that about their opinion on social media, right? The era that we live in right now, there's a lot of talk about something like TikTok getting banned, right? And and there's been so much normalization of social media culture being a part of our everyday lives and the way that we just literally go out and exist in every minute of every day of our life, right? It's that much a part of it now. And I'm curious for you, you know, somebody who is a, a, a mental health professional, what are you kind of seeing of the the effects of social media that maybe people aren't necessarily aware of or want to admit or or just not having the the right conversation right now? I think this is a very good question, and I, I have a lot of I think lots of different perspectives that are coming up for me. So sure. I'm coming up. So one thing is with so I think it's with like with anything, it's how do you use it? Mm-hmm. Like how do you use this? How you interact with social media will impact just your general experience. So, this is something that's that's healthy, or if it's something that's on this, it will like put it on a spectrum, like healthy, or is it like unhealthy? Right. Right. Um, if you're going social media and you're constantly engaging in just like arguments and discussions with people, and you're being, you're you're basically, um, or is it like stressing yourself out all the time? Mm-hmm. Like I. Think you probably need a break from that right right, right. <laughs> stop trolling stop yeah. trolling you know all social media reddit is also social media just to, like, sure. in case people like <laughs> go, go the job. no like if you find that you're activated by everything constantly that's not mm-hmm. healthy and when i say activated is sometimes we can go on social media you see the post you know it's a highlight reel of everyone's life right wow this person is doing so many things. Or I went to high school with this person and look at everything they've done. What am I doing with my life? Mm-hmm. That self comparison, you know, is a thief of joy, right? As they right. say. Mm-hmm. That in that place, I think it can be very dangerous, right? And right. that's that goes back to the boundaries, right? You have to set boundaries with yourself. Like if I find myself triggered by certain accounts, even now, like right. I, you know, my immediate that is like, do I unfollow or do I mute this account? Because there's something about this account right now that is making me like, uh, making some of my insecurities come out. And sure. like, I need, to, I need to take care of myself. And that's mute, block, whatever it, I need to do. Nothing mm-hmm. against that person. That's a boundary that I need for me, right? Yeah. Um, but I have that awareness. And unless you have that awareness, you're not going to know to do that. You're just going to open and you're going to have a cycle of stress all day long. Mm-hmm. So then what happens? not sleeping well i'm super stressed all the time i'm getting sick all the time because that's what happens when your body's under chronic stress mm. so from that angle i i would say it can be really unhealthy so it's yeah. again the you how are you utilizing it right however i do think that social media has been a very powerful tool mm. um at, at least in my journey to destigmatize mental health yeah. because an increased representation of the types of stories that we're hearing um, you know, like, because you get to choose now who you want to receive certain messages from, who you're yeah. going to follow. And that that choice is very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, so like, I love following other first gen accounts, for mm-hmm. example, um, because when I'm seeing them, they normalize the, the struggle and, you know, the successes. Right. It's not just always the highlight reel. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's so many mental health professionals, so many medical professionals, so many amazing people who are on there volunteering their time to okay. share valuable resources and information with, with folks, right? So I, from that part of it, I think it's it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. Um, and it helps, like you, I think you mentioned the word normal. You said normalizing. It helps normalize that we are not alone mm-hmm. um, in the that we have right that's why like uh, podcasts and like Mm -hmm. episodes and shows and conversations like this are so important because you know my value is if one person can benefit from anything that i do then it's worth doing Mm -hmm. i don't need five hundred thousand people to hear the message i just need the one 
right? And if you're using social media in a way that is respectful of your boundaries around, am I being triggered by this content? Let me mm -hmm. stop doing some of that. Uh, I am guilty of this. So like, I want to be aware of this. I, I want to acknowledge it. It's like sometimes sure. I check so first thing as I wake up. Yeah. I don't want to look like, do I have any messages? Like, right. how did my parents do? Like, whatever. Um, and that's something that I'm working on doing less and less of because that does activate me, right? Yeah. That does make me go, I, I'm like, oh, wait, I need to do this. And I find myself then right. I'm in bed scrolling for the next two hours instead right. of getting up right. and doing what yeah. you do. So um, like, I, I guess it simplifies, it's like the healthy and unhealthy ways of navigating social media. And it's important right. to know your boundaries around it. Uh, um, but I do think that you can connect with a lot of amazing creators and contents and, and friends. Ultimately, it is to sure. keep your close loved ones. Um, and so it's how do you, I, I guess, do, use it responsibly, right? Um, yes. So that said, that means that there's a level of critical thinking that is involved right. when we're <laughs> online and doing this. Um, and so that's why I think there's an age limit on these Mm -hmm. or a minimum age requirement on these, but we know that that's not always the case. That, right. that They're not all that age. And so I do think that social media can be very dangerous for young minds, um, especially, you know, when you're in that peak insecure um, era of life that we all go through. Right. <laughs> we do that. Um, and uh, like how much that can impact an individual's self-esteem Mm -hmm. um, may lead them. So we've heard about different trends that people or young young minds do or young kids do that are dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. And then like not having anyone to kind of check them, say like, hey, maybe that's not a good idea. Right. Um, so I think that's where I would say it's dangerous. So like I said, I think my my perspectives on social media, what I think about it, how it, it, it especially when it comes to mental health, is that if you can use it responsibly, I think it could be a wonderful tool. Right. Um, but if you if you find that you're using it and it's distracting you from your everyday life, you know, from your work, from your friends, like if you find mm -hmm. that you're living on your phone, um, you're living for the likes, you're living for the whatever, then I'd probably say you need a little bit of a break from social media and reassess how you want to use it. Um, and if you're a child, um, I think that there should be some supervision. Yeah, I, I, th I, I guess to all that. And I, I think, you know, the, the part that like, I that is sticking out to me what you said is using it responsibly but the fact that we have to make that distinction showcases how potentially dangerous mm -hmm. it can be with when you don't have the awareness of what you're using it for or sort of like the void that you might be trying to fill with it oftentimes right because I think about it in terms of beyond just like people arguing in comments and, and obviously it being an unnecessary stressor in that manner i also look at it like so many people use it as a means for instant validation or gratification to sort of as a workaround for the void that they're feeling right the lack of self-love that they're feeling and and i that's what i live in fear of a bit and, and i've been called grumpy you know when i because i'm calling out like you know it's like man like just be on vacation. You don't have to be documenting everything with like a professional angle photo. Like it, you know, what you're doing is like taking yourself out of the moment and living for the gratification of other people saying, yes, that's a cool vacation you went on type of thing, right? Rather than, than being present and, and enjoying it. And for me, even with that awareness, I feel it sometimes where I might work hard on a post and I think it's amazing and I put it up and it does terribly. And then I'm like, man, maybe I'm just not as good at this whole thing as I think I am and I should rethink life a little bit, right? And and then I feel bad about myself because what I'm putting out is an extension of myself. And I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the fact that I'm that this is me searching for validation, that I need to go internally. But there are a lot, a lot of people who have never maybe done the therapy, maybe never delved deep and had that alone time to recognize their insecurities and what's coming up for them that, you know, are really just using this every single day as a means to kind of quiet the dark voices in their head. Um, or in the worst case, they're beating themselves up and thinking there's something wrong with them if a post doesn't do well or whatever it might be. And I think that's sort of what a lot of people are failing to to realize because we've just normalized this idea of sort of doing so much for the attention of, of others. 
Yes, yes. No, and I love you saying that. And honestly, as I heard you talking, I'm like, I think we we can have a whole other episode. Sure. <laughs> social yes. media, social media, and mental health. Yeah. Maybe there's so many years to it, but but I think you're right. I think, it, and especially for some people, it has become their main source of income. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see creators talk about it all the time, the burnout that they experience because it because they, they first they tell you. You don't have to overthink it. Everything is content. Everything right, right, right. Content, blah, blah, blah. Right. But then when it becomes your full time job, like mm-hmm. everything literally is content and existing is exhausting and existing is work and hard. And what you think is going to be fun suddenly takes you out of the moment. Like mm-hmm. you said, you're on vacation and you're thinking about, I better get that shot. I have to get up at 5 a.m. to do this. It's no longer a vacation, it's work. Right. Um, that's again coming back to that's where using it responsibly right it's okay you want to get some nice it's like let's say you're let's say taking like pictures is important to you on this vacation sure set limits, set limits around what that looks like maybe you give yourself like one day one chunk of the for like an hour or whatever that's when you get to do your stage shots your whatever then it's a fun activity as that you're doing because you have free time and you enjoy it you want right. to right but that also doesn't mean you have to post it right away. Like I'm big right. on like, maybe I'll film something here and there, but I don't need to post this right now. Right. Fact, or obsess over how it does even, right? Like it, it's like, do I do I like what I fuck, the shot that I took, did I devote the time, right? And if I do, that should be where it ends, right? Because that's like, that's where it's healthy. Then it's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm expressing maybe a creative part of myself that I, you know, um, that I enjoy doing, that I don't normally get to do, whatever it might be, sure. But like, but it's, I think that's the um, the the disconnect that happens is people will justify it because they say I just want I enjoy aesthetics I enjoy taking pictures of, of cool things but then on the flip side of it are constantly refreshing to see who liked it and 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 I think that's where it's like well now you're crossing over into a potentially um, dangerous place mentally because you sort of created your self worth this identity of what your self worth is be it based upon if this does well or not you know i'm a great artist or i have a great eye for this based upon if this does well or not and if it doesn't do good it means i suck i beat myself up about it or whatever the case might be yes yes and so your this is your narrative right it's, your narrative is what's most important how do how am i experiencing this like like you mentioned it's like i like this i like this shot i took it makes yeah. me so happy and i want to share it with the world and but then, yeah, we're so used to seeking that external validation, wanting to see other, you know, wanting that little dopamine hit from mm-hmm. seeing those lights. Yeah, we forget that the whole purpose of sharing was because it was something I liked and enjoyed, and I wanted anyone else to see it, regardless right. of if they like or engage with it or not. Um, and and yeah, so I think that that's also very very powerful. It's like something to think about. So I guess if someone's listening to this, if you're that person, maybe take a little bit of a break <laughs> from yeah. social media. I mean, it's just, I think, I think it's just the scary nature of the on-demand world that we live in a little bit, right? And I feel like it makes all of us adapt some narcissistic tendencies almost. And I think that it also, it also sort of, even just as an artist, right? As a musician, like I think about, you know, okay, uh, you know, you, you write music, you go in the studio to record it. And it's, this is probably traditionally would have been over the span of maybe six months to a year, right? You're working on this body of work then eventually it gets presented to the world, right? And then they can have it, but you put all, you're all into it and it was for you for that year or whatever. But now the culture we live in with like TikTok things is a musician will create an idea, not finish it, post it. And if it gets a good response, then they decide it's worthy of them finishing it or putting their their heart into it. And yeah. I, I like, and I've everybody, I know people on the surface are gonna be like, but who cares? It doesn't, but I'm like, but you're missing sort of, the spiritual part of you conceptualizing something and bringing your art to life that's what this was about and now you've turned it into something about other people and whether you realize it or not you're sort of making at the very least putting the value of what you create in the hands of other people to determine if it is good or not and that sort of defeats the purpose of creating art or creating anything in general and i think you know again that turns to you living for other people's opinion rather than what naturally you just feel in your heart i think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no i hear you i hear you with that and then i was 
as you were saying that, I thought about like what I said earlier. I was like, I think when I create content, because I create informative content, right? Sure. And so it's meant to like understand. I was like, I, I just want like one person to benefit from it. But as, as you said that, I thought about, I was like, well, that, but also like, I, I benefit from it in, in my own way. I was like, that one person is also me because this is what I share. Mm -hmm. It's also part of my healing journey. Yes. Right? In my process, right? Um, and so maybe that one person is that that version of me 10 years ago, 10 years from now, who needs yeah. to see this? I don't know. But I think I'm, you're leaving me with a lot of food for thought, I think. Is, is what <laughs> no, I, yeah, and I, I apologize for going on rants. I just, I just, it's like, I'm like, I, I just, I just feel like there's like, something missing from the everyday conversation about social media that I think a lot of people are not mm -hmm. recognizing that I think years from now, we're going to look back and be like, this was sort of where we began to lose a bit of the honesty within art or communication in general, um, because we are always mm -hmm. constantly performing because we can perform for the instant applause without leaving our house, essentially, right. And I think um that's where we're losing some of the greatness i think and and you know this, this is like not necessarily uh all therapy talk this is also just like me as even just like a music industry person it's like there's a reason why there's a lack of of star power in the modern generation of musicians is because there is a lack of um value in greatness and really just connecting with something on a deeper level and then giving it to the world you know and i think that's sort of you know, going to begin to pour out into different aspects. And again, that's, you know, maybe a, a conversation for a, a different time. But um, I just, yeah, I, I just think about, I f live in fear a bit of what becomes normalized, the quick dopamine hits, the instant validation, and how that just can't be potentially healthy for us to be showing up as our best selves in the long run. No, I, uh, yeah. Like showing up as our best selves. I think, I, especially like when I think of art and creating art and the process of it, it, and especially when, from my perspective, coming from a healing perspective, I think art, art is a form of self-expression and healing, mm -hmm. any kind of art. And when you're crowdsourcing art, it's it's no longer, it, it's, I guess it's a different kind of art, sure. but you, you can fool yourself saying that it's a art that's healing for you when you're crowdsourcing it. That's, right. that's a whole different kind of um I, I think that's a whole different thing altogether so yeah. um but i'm with you and i remember i i think of even just the other day i was there i was trying to i was like i'm just gonna doodle and then it wasn't coming out like anything that i wanted to i'm like well the whole point was for me to just just feel the marker on the paper and to just let myself like mess around and mm -hmm. that's okay Right. Um, but I think we also have this pressure to suddenly be the best at everything that we're doing, right? right? Like, yeah. be the, even for ourselves, even if we're not sharing it with anyone. And so I'm mean, to remind, remember how much of a process that is. And so that is in relation to what, how you shared, you know, creating music used to be a six month process. Mm -hmm. And now everyone just wants that immediate. Um, and I think that's just like with anything um, art related, it's, creating art is a lot of being patient, slowing down, being intentional and reconnecting with other parts of yourself that maybe don't get activated as much. Mm. Um, but you can only really do that on, on your own. <laughs> like you can only do that. That's time with yourself. And maybe when you let yourself get bored, um, mm. because there's all those the studies now, I think that talk about the importance of boredom. Right, right. How we never, we don't live in an, an era where we can even be bored anymore because it's constant stimulation at, at, at all times. Thanks to what we, you know, the, what we, the power we have in our hand, basically with the phone. Exactly. Oh man. All right. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much we could, we could get into. That'll be maybe a part two, uh, further down the line, but I, I appreciate you you hopping on here. I think there there's so much you know just gems, so many gems that were dropped. But also bringing it full circle back to your work, you know, I think I can honestly say that people like like you have been incredibly helpful for me when I was searching for a therapist to tackle specific issues within my life. I needed somebody who came from a similar background to me, and when I was able to find that that was when I was able to have those major breakthroughs in that area of my life. So, you know, I think the work you're doing is, is obviously incredibly important in that um, because you're providing representation and you're, you're uh, somebody that, you know, grows up in a similar background from the community first gen can look to you and open up to you and know that, you know, they're going to be understood and seen 
Whereas, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case, you know, what, 10, 20 years ago when the norm of people in your field were, were white people, essentially, you know, that, that was just the, the norm. Um, so I salute you for, for the work that you're, you're doing. I think it's just, it's incredible. Um, and I hope you, you recognize it on, on a regular basis. Thank, thank you so much um, for saying that and acknowledging that. I think that I feel, I, I mean, I, honestly, I feel this way towards so many, like I feel this way towards the work that you're doing. I feel this way towards like anyone else who shows, because I think, so let me go back. Stories are healing. Mm -hmm. And so when we show up our stories, that helps us heal. And that is so powerful. And so that's why I they love the work that you're, you're doing. And I think, yes, as a mental health professional, like, I mean, it was one of the reasons I wanted to be a psychologist, you know, and like therapist in the first place. I realized that there weren't, there wasn't anyone focusing on like the cultural impacts on our mental health. Mm -hmm. And I was tired of every time I wanted to go see someone or a therapist, like there was not anyone that I could find who looked like me, who had any shared experiences. And everyone who I work with, they always say, you know, I chose to work with you because I already felt that you could see me and understand me mm -hmm. and I didn't have to explain some of the um, mundane details or what the, you know of my life because I felt like you would just get it um, and that's also powerful because I don't know how much if you know this but the strongest predictor of success in therapy is that client therapist alliance that relationship mm -hmm you feel comfortable with your therapist you will trust them more easily you will mm -hmm. open up more easily and so then it will feel more effective because mm -hmm. you also feel safer and more comfortable and so mm -hmm. that's why it's so powerful that myself and all the other you know BIPOC clinicians out here are are showing up mm -hmm. wanting to do the work and having our own therapists ourselves yeah yeah that's beautiful and, and well said and a great reminder for anybody who's considering therapy or, or, you know, looking into it, you can have that prerequisite in your mind where you can think to yourself, I'm not just going to take the first therapist that th is thrown my way that my insurance covers or that I see on better help or whatever. There's a process to this, just like dating, I, I want to find the right person. And maybe the first person you you meet or the second person doesn't feel like the right fit. But that's not a reason to give up. You know, there, this is a, a process. It's not going to be something that you instantly just nail it maybe the first time. And I think that's also something that might turn off a lot of people is if they had a bad experience with a, a therapist, thinking that this is how every therapist is or every interaction is going to be. And I think we have to realize that it's a process before finding the right person and the right fit, the right connection. Yes, it is. I'm so happy you're normalizing that. But yeah, agreed on every, every note. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. Uh, where can people follow you and, and get more of the, the amazing content that you're creating? Yes, I think just follow, I'm most active on Instagram. So come follow me on Instagram at the first gen psychologist. And, you know, I recently started a new series with a fellow mental health professional that's called 1-800 Boundaries. And so where we give you examples on how to express these boundaries with your loved ones. And so it's a baby, baby series. And so if anyone listening to this is thinking about the boundaries, how do I set up boundaries, send me a DM and we would love to give you a little bit of a role play to help set you up for success with your next boundary. I love it. Well, thank you so much for, for hopping on the show. And uh, we'll definitely hopefully get to reconnect uh, down the road again. Thank you so much. Man, big shout out to my guest this week, Dr. Lizette Sanchez for hopping on the show. So good to finally get to connect with her. I was a fan, like I mentioned, of, of the article she was a part of for We Are Me Too. And I just love the work that she's doing. I mentioned this when we were talking, but for me, in my journey in therapy, it was such a blessing when I sort of recognized the power of having somebody from our community or the first time I was able to have somebody from our community as my, my therapist, a person of color, and how it just made the situations that I was going through a bit easier to sort of work through because they understood it. I didn't feel like I had to explain some of the cultural differences and things like that. And it was a, a blessing. So I'll, the work that she's doing is amazing, especially in a field that traditionally has been dominated by, by white people. Uh, I just, you know, grateful that people like her exist, grateful for all the content that she's making and, and the conversation. So she's definitely amazing. And, and we salute her for being on the show. Now, with that said, I want to get y'all's take on the conversation around mental health uh, from a different perspective than, than I usually have before, I think. So we'll do that for our Ask a Gringo segment. Ask a Gringo. Uh, I have a question. 
All right. So at DJ Dramas, you want to be a part of these conversations in the future. But I just posted my Instagram asking people to share their own journey with mental health, not necessarily what they've gone through, but if their journey has sort of rubbed off on those around them or if people would share maybe a story about their parents, if they have gone, you know, to talk to somebody, you know, if, if their parents are a part of sort of embracing this idea of, of mental health and therapy and all those things, because I think for my generation and younger, it's become far more common to be a lot more open about this. Right. And, and generally speaking, of course, like I'm not here to shame anybody who hasn't gotten to that point yet or whatever the case may be. But I know it's far more common for my generation and younger, whereas, you know, our parents' generation still, I think, has a bit of that stigma. So I'm curious if anybody has had any sort of uh, breakthroughs or has had any instances where their parents have still have an old opinion about mental health or have begun to embrace it. So that's sort of the question for today's uh, show. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to try to get to a couple here. At Growing With Sin says, I actually influenced my friend who's a total toxic macho man to go to therapy, a little big flex. And that's amazing. I think I think what people don't sort of realize is, A, you can't, you can't get people to do these things before they're ready, right? Even if it's very obvious to you that they would benefit greatly from um, – from speaking to somebody, you know, they have to be ready to, to, to want to open up to someone. Right. And I think sometimes the sort of best practice is to just sort of share your own journey. I don't, I don't necessarily mean it doesn't have to be on social media per se. Right. If you want to, that's amazing. If not, uh, I understand, you know, sort of wanted to keep it a little bit closer to the, you know, your, your chest, if you will. I think that's the saying, but I think what you'll be shocked at is when people begin to see you growing, when they begin to see you on your journey and how far you've come and all that you are are learning, they will naturally be inquisitive about it and inquire and, and want to get more information, you know, and try and, and see the benefits, you know, for themselves. So um, I think that's sort of the beauty about healing as well is the way that it impacts the people around you. I've definitely noticed that for myself, for sure. Um, friends in my life or family, you know, really sort of taking a bit more of an interest in mental health and at the very least being curious just because they've sort of seen all that it's done for me on my journey. And let's see, at Boricua, is it Boricua Chic 732 says, I always try to talk to my parents about it and convince them to go, but unfortunately, they don't seem open to it. I get that, and they don't seem open to it just yet. You never know where it's going to end up, but I mean, I relate to that. My parents, I think, could could benefit from some, some therapy just as anybody else, and you know, they're not as receptive or open to it as as I would love for them to be. I think you know, that that's part of the journey though. I think I know for a fact though, like we, we kind of touched on before, even with my own personal journey, I know that it's had a, a impact on them and definitely sort of opened their, their minds up to the benefits of it, or even just having their own reflections, right? Because when I've expressed certain things that I've learned about myself or my upbringing, it's definitely made them go back and sort of revisit maybe their own or, or situations in the, in the past, you know? So like I had said, there's still positive stuff happening there, even just by proxy of, of them associating with me, who is somebody who obviously believes in this stuff heavily. But I think, you know, it's 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 tough. And I think you got to be patient at the end of the day, you know, and you can't try and force these things. I think people, when they're ready, they'll do it. And maybe they might never be ready. But, um, you know, you, you just got to try to be there for them as, as best as you can and not get too frustrated. I think it's tough once you get older. And a lot of people, once they reach a certain age, feel like they're too old to change or too old to try something new. You know, they have these sort of blockers in the way. So I think they, they struggle with that a little bit and we have to be empathetic to it. So, um, you know, obviously, again, I would love for people like my parents to, to hop in some therapy and, and I'm still holding out hope. But, you know, um, I get why it's it's still weird for them. Right. It's something completely different that they didn't grow up around or grow up with so much stigma around. So I, I definitely understand it to a degree. With that said, thank you all so much for participating in our Ask a Gringo segment. Again, at DJ Dramas on Instagram. I'll be a part of these conversations. With that said, let's quickly tie everything we talked about today in a neat little bow in a segment called Conclusion Stew. 
I'll be quick on this. I know it's a, we're running a little bit longer. I want to try to keep these episodes within like an hour. But yeah, I, I just I keep bringing these conversations to our 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 platform here because I I just think we constantly at times need reminders that we're not alone. But at the same time, I think it's also important to highlight people from our community who are doing the work, who are providing safe spaces for those of us who are looking to heal. You know, Dr. Lizette Sanchez is, is you know, a gift for that, right? And I think also, you know, a lot of times, even if it's me talking about mental health, it might sound different coming from her or maybe she brings about a different conversation or or makes the conversation shift in a different way that maybe now impacts somebody in, you know differently than it would have when they just heard me talking about it or when they heard it a year ago right so i think these conversations are needed to, to continue to happen they're important specifically when you talk about all the nuances of, of specifically our community or bipoc communities there's a lot that goes into it and you know a lot of it is not covered in general mental health conversations that we see in other places so that's why i love to continuously bring people on here who are doing the work who are providing those safe spaces who are experts in that field um, to hopefully continue doing my part to destigmatizing it and and people being able to get the help that they you know need um and that we all need honestly again it's it's universal like she said you don't have to be in crisis to go see a therapist it's it's great to just have somebody to work through i mean even how i talked about at the beginning of the episode I like didn't want to admit I was burnt out. Basically, I was finding every excuse in the book as to like why I just wasn't being, you know, my normal productive self. And I just had to talk through with with somebody who is skilled at sort of knowing how to get to the bottom of of feelings and conversations, you know. So that is sort of the of course, the, the benefit of it. The beauty of it is by the end of that conversation with my therapist, I, you know, was able to come to a conclusion that I already knew in my heart, but I was able to kind of work through it with somebody um, to to kind of help me sort out a lot of the thoughts and feelings I was going through. And then uh, I can create a, a positive sort of plan of action to get myself back on track and, and alleviate some of that you know stress that I've been feeling. So, you know, again, we don't have to be at the darkest moments of our lives to seek therapy. You know, we, we could just be wanting, you know, a a person who doesn't have a real like you know opinion as to our life right like it's tough to talk to family and things like that because they're biased but to have an unbiased sort of expert just speaking to you about emotions feelings and all that you're going through i think there's so much value in that at the very least so just beautiful stuff so it's everybody's doing the work those of you who are still on the fence i completely get it hopefully conversations like this one begin to or continue to open your mind just a little bit to potentially talking to somebody and and you know, exploring what uh, help might be out there for you and whatever you're struggling with. So love bringing these conversations to our community. I think they're incredibly important. And yeah, thank you all for tuning in. With that said, we will catch you on Thursday for our Thursday Trends episode, of course. So then stay safe and I'll talk to you soon. Peace.